Imagine yourself at a barbecue with your family and friends. I am pretty sure that the barbecue would be incomplete without some perfectly grilled squash. Those low calorie delicious squash with some salt, pepper and olive oil on top would surely make your get together healthier and better. Or even if you're not a barbecue person, you definitely might have enjoyed a hot bowl of squash soup at your home. Well, many of you might have enjoyed squash in a way or another and only seen healthy looking squash fruits at the grocery stores. But did you know that squash plants in the grower's field is infected by several diseases and sometimes Severe infection of these diseases can even cause up to 100% yield loss. Well, just in case you're not familiar with the squash field, this is a picture of a healthy squash field that would produce acceptable yield profitable to the growers. However, this is a picture of a diseased squash field and even though it might look similar to any other squash field to the normal eyes, these yellow diseased squash plants here significantly reduce the yield and quality of squash fruits produced, thus reducing profitability to the growers and quality to the consumers. Now, there are many viral, fungal and bacterial diseases infecting squash, but my PhD research at the University of Florida focuses on one major viral disease of squash named papaya ring spot virus or PRSV. Thus, my talk today is going to be on accelerated development of papaya ring spot virus resistance in squash. Now, before I jump into the details of my work, I would like to talk a little bit more on papaya ring spot virus or PRSV. As you can see in the figure here, papaya ring spot virus infects both the vegetative and reproductive part of the plant. Infection on vegetative part of the plant results in severe leaf mottling as can be seen here and infection on reproductive parts of the plant result in deformed and unmarketable fruits as can be seen here. Studies have shown that severe infection of PRSV in squash can cause up to 80% yield loss. Now, just in case you are thinking, why not control these plant pathogenic viruses by just spraying some chemicals? Well, that's not possible in case of these plant pathogenic viruses because viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, which means that they get into the plant cellular system and multiply within the plant cellular system. So any chemical that is used to kill the virus will kill the plant as well, and we definitely don't want that. So the best option for controlling yield loss due to viral infection in squash would be genetic control or use of virus resistant squash varieties. However, unfortunately, squash varieties with stable resistance to viruses are currently unavailable in the market. Now, the virus resistant squash varieties can either be developed by using traditional breeding approaches and the process for traditional breeding looks something like this. In case of traditional breeding, we would cross the virus susceptible commercial squash variety with the virus resistant wild squash genotype. The progeny obtained from the cross are then grown until maturity to select for the virus resistant individual. Now the process of selecting virus resistant individual is continued in each generation until we get high yielding virus resistant squash plants that can be released as a virus resistant squash variety. And this process of developing virus resistant squash variety by using traditional breeding approaches can take up to eight to 10 years. Or alternatively, virus resistant squash varieties can be developed by using molecular breeding or marker assisted selection. 
and the process for molecular breeding looks something like this. Even in case of molecular breeding, the initial step of crossing the commercial virus susceptible squash variety with the wild squash genotype is the same. However, in this case, the progenies obtained are not grown until maturity. In case of molecular breeding, virus resistant individuals are selected in each generation with the help of DNA markers, which can be done by extracting DNA from the plants when they are really young. So as in case of molecular breeding, you don't need to grow the plant until maturity to select for the virus resistant individuals in each generation. Development of new virus resistant squash varieties can be done just within four to five years time period, unlike in traditional breeding, where it takes almost eight to 10 years for the development of new virus resistant squash varieties. However, unfortunately, the genomic regions and DNA markers associated with PRSV resistance in squash are currently unknown, thus making molecular breeding in squash impossible. Thus, keeping in mind this knowledge gap in squash breeding program, my study aimed to identify the genomic region associated with PRSV resistance in squash and then develop DNA markers associated with PRSV resistance that can be used in molecular breeding of squash. Now, before I jump into the details of all the methods used in the study, the slide here provides a brief overview of all the steps used to achieve the study goal. The first goal of the study, as I mentioned, was identification of genomic regions associated with PRSV resistance. And the first step for the process was development of the mapping population. Now, just in case you're not familiar with the plant science research, let me tell you that in any plant science genomic region identification study, the first step is the development of the mapping population. And in my case also, it was the same. So the first step is development of the mapping population. Now, after first step, we move to step two, which was identification of the genomic region using the mapping population that was developed in the step one. The second goal of the study was to develop DNA markers associated with resistance, which takes us to step three, which was to develop DNA markers from the genomic regions identified in step two. And then the final step of the study was validation of the markers developed in step three, which was to check if the markers are actually working or not in differentiating the resistant and the susceptible plants at the DNA level. Now, don't get worried if you didn't get a lot of terms in this slide because I'm gonna explain each of these steps in brief in the upcoming slide. Starting with step one, that was development of the mapping population. So for developing the mapping population, we crossed the virus resistant wild squash genotype with the virus susceptible commercial squash variety. And in breeding languages, the progeny obtained from this cross are known as F1. The F1 was then self to produce the F2 population. And if you are familiar with Mendel's law, then you would know that this F2 plants would be segregating for virus resistance. So the F2 plants are then artificially inoculated with the virus and 10 most resistant and 10 most susceptible individuals are selected. That would be our mapping population. Now, just in case you lost me when I said the term artificial inoculation and you're wondering how the plants are artificially inoculated with the virus, well, let me walk you through that process. For artificial inoculation, we maintain the live viral infected plants in the cages in the greenhouse, which can be seen in the figure here. For the artificial inoculation process, we take the leaves from the viral infected plant as can be seen here in the figure A, and then we grind these viral infected leaves in the phosphate buffer as can be seen in the B, and then 
we get a clean viral solution in the phosphate buffer as can be seen in the figure C. So after getting this clean viral solution, we apply this clean viral solution in the plants as can be seen in the figure here. And if the plants are susceptible, they start showing the symptoms two weeks after the inoculation. Based on the response of the plants to the viruses, we select 10 most resistant and 10 most susceptible plants. And as I mentioned earlier, these plants would be then used as the mapping population. Now, moving to step two, which is genomic region identification using the mapping population that was developed in step one. So for genomic region identification, we extract the DNA from the parents and the resistant and susceptible selective individuals. The extracted DNA is then sent for sequencing to whole genome sequencing labs providing sequencing facilities. Basically, we get the sequencing results within a month or so. And as the genomic DNA is made up of nucleotide, the sequencing results look something like this, which is nothing but long strings of nucleotides arranged in specific order. After getting the sequencing results, we do some bioinformatic analysis where we compare the nucleotide arrangement of the resistant and susceptible individuals. Now, this would be similar to comparing two necklaces of different colored beads arranged in specific order and then identifying the regions that have significantly different colored beads. Thankfully, we have some strong computer algorithms to do the comparison and then by doing the bioinformatic analysis, we are able to identify the regions between the resistant and susceptible individuals that have significantly different nucleotide arrangement. Scientifically speaking, the regions between the resistant and susceptible individuals that have significantly different nucleotide arrangement would be the genomic region associated with PRSV resistance. So hooray, after doing the bioinformatic analysis, we are able to identify the genomic region associated with PRSV resistance. This is the graph that shows how the output of the genomic region identification study looked like. Now, as the squash genomic DNA is made up of 20 chromosomes, the x-axis here gives the number of chromosomes, that is the 20, and the y-axis here gives the difference in nucleotide arrangement between the resistant and the susceptible individuals. Now, I would like you to focus your attention on the peak here on chromosome 9. This peak here means that this region here in chromosome 9 is significantly different between the resistant and susceptible individuals at 95% confidence interval where this green line here represents 95% confidence interval. So basically, it would mean that this is the region that is significantly associated with PRSV resistance and squash. This graph here is just the zoomed in version of what's happening in chromosome 9. This top graph here, the black dots represent the nucleotide arrangement of the susceptible individuals. In this middle graph here, the black dot represents the nucleotide arrangement of the resistant individuals. And this bottom graph here, the blue line represents the difference in nucleotide arrangement between the resistant and susceptible individuals. I would like you all to focus your attention on this region here inside the blue bar. So this is the region where the nucleotide arrangement is significantly different between the resistant and susceptible individuals. So in other words, again, this is the genomic region associated with PRSV resistance. So after identification of genomic region associated with PRSV resistance, our next step is marker development from this genomic region. And now I wouldn't go into details of how the marker are developed from this genomic region, but it's a straightforward process and is done by using a software called as Batch Primer 3. 
Now, after development of the marker, the next step is marker validation, which is to actually check if the marker developed in our study are working or not, which means to check if they are able to differentiate the resistant and susceptible plants at the DNA level or not. For marker validation, we actually extract the DNA from the resistant and susceptible parent, and then we mix the marker that was developed in our study with the DNA. Now this marker DNA combination is then fed into a machine called a light cycler, which looks something like this. Now, if the marker developed in our study are actually working, then the output of the light cycler machine should be able to differentiate the resistant and susceptible plants DNA. And this is how the output of the light cycler study looked like. And here in this graph, we can see that there were two separate groupings of the resistant and the susceptible individuals, which means that yes, the marker developed in our study are actually working and they are able to differentiate the resistant and susceptible plants at the DNA level. So yay, from this graph, we can say that yes, we have developed the markers that are actually working. So from the study, we can conclude that we were able to identify the genomic region associated with PRSV resistance and chromosome 9 of squash. And also, we were able to develop the DNA markers associated with PRSV resistance that could differentiate the resistant and susceptible plants at the DNA level. So what's the implication of the study? Uh, well, the DNA markers that were developed in the study can be used for rapid selection of PRSV-resistant individuals in each generation. And with the help of these DNA marker-assisted molecular breeding, new PRSV-resistant squash varieties can be developed just within four to five years time period, unlike in traditional breeding where it takes almost eight to 10 years for the development of new virus resistant squash varieties. So with the rapid development of PRSV resistant squash varieties in the future, growers don't have to worry about yield loss due to viral infections and the consumers will get healthy and delicious squash to enjoy in every meal. With that, I would like to thank you all for attention and I would like to end my presentation. Thank you.